Thanks for coming over to try the new beer, guys. I actually really want to know what you think about it. I guess it's okay. What kind of yeast did you use? Voss Kvike. Uh, bless you. No, that's actually the yeast I used. What? Kvike, you know, the Norwegian kind of farmhouse yeast? I think you mean... Quike. No, dude. It's pronounced Kvike. Get it right. Listen, Steve. Any self-respecting homebrewer would know that it's pronounced Quake. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's what he said. Whatever, dude. It's still Kvike. No, it's pronounced Quake. Kvike. Quake. I think I heard a Norwegian guy say quack once. Kvike. Quick. Kvike. Quick. Kvike. Quake! Dudes, dudes, calm down. Maybe it's pronounced Kvik? No. Okay, okay. Kvike! Quake! Kvike! Kvike! What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another video. Ever since I've been working on my home brewery in the basement, I have been dying to get brewing and I have been going through beer, I have empty kegs, and I need beer fast. And what's the best way to fill a keg of beer within a week? Ferment a beer with a Kvike yeast. So that's what we're doing today. We're gonna to be starting off a series of uh, Kvike-based beers that I have really been looking forward to doing for a very long time. A channel viewer by the name of Jesper Falk sent a whole bunch of dried Kvike strains my way last year. I have four different strains of Kvike yeast. I have Voss, Framgarden, Scar, and Hernindal. Um, and I'm sorry if I butcher your pronunciation. However, I'm also gonna add Lutra to that list simply because Lutra is one of the most common uh, Kvike strains that is used out there. It's more of an isolated substrain of Hornindal uh, than anything else, but we'll talk about that when we get to the Lutra video. But I wanted to include it simply because it's very easy to get a hold of here in the United States. Uh, but otherwise, I'll be going through and brewing a sort of unique beer around each type of yeast, uh, just for some fun. And today's beer is going to be an Azaka Smash uh, Pale Ale, probably, uh, using the Kvike yeast. First of all, what is Kvike? Uh, and how do you say it? That's the whole point of the skit at the beginning of this. How do you say this word? Uh, so, as an American, I'm notoriously terrible at pronouncing things that are not American. Sorry about that. Um, but from what I can tell, the best way to pronounce Kvike is Kvike, kind of, or Kvike. The amount of comments that I've gotten about how I'm not pronouncing Kvike properly, is it's kind of hilarious, um, and they don't seem to agree with each other either. It's just kind of a way of pronouncing things that's in the Norwegian language that's not something that Americans can really figure out how to say properly, so I'm just gonna stick with Kvike, all right? We're just gonna say Kvike. Y'all know what it is anyway. Kvike is a Scandinavian farmhouse alias that kind of was really unknown to the rest of the world until kind of about 10 years ago. Most Kvike strains are a blend of regular brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces, and types of wild yeasts or uh, other microorganisms in kind of a unique way. However, they're not gonna sour your beer. And what's really interesting about Kvike yeast and what's very powerful about it, especially for the home brewer, is that it's basically temperature insensitive. It really likes to ferment at a very high temperature relative to other ale yeasts. So Kvike is happiest above 75 degrees. Lutra, I have fermented at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of that high temperature, it also finishes fermentation very quickly. And because of its unique genetics, it also doesn't really have some of the tendencies to throw off flavors at high temperatures that you would get with other ale yeasts. And it also is a very low producer of diacetyl. So it's really kind of hard to have a problem with this yeast, but you have to take care of it properly. Something, this has been a learning curve for myself, and it's also something that is a little hard to kind of understand when the first time you buy it. It's not magic, you have to take care of the yeast. It's very nutrient hungry, so you really do need to add a whole bunch of extra nutrients to your boil to take care of it, and it's also helpful to just give it a really good, fresh, hot start as you take it off of the boil. So don't cool your wort all the way down, only bring it down to like 85 degrees, and then the yeast will start fermenting within about four hours. And the other thing too is that it has a really nice propensity towards fermenting higher gravity beers better than lower gravity beers. So if you're fermenting like a 5% or less beer with it, it's going to be a little bit tougher to work. Uh, it's gonna need a little bit more time. It's gonna need a little bit more prodding along. 
Whereas with a higher gravity beer, it doesn't need as much babying along. The other thing too is that different strains have different properties. For example, Voss is very famous for its orange character, but that only happens when you ferment it hot enough. Same thing with the legendary kind of tropical fruit character of Hornendal. You really have to get that thing very hot in order to get that sort of character. Otherwise, it's gonna be kind of clean, and sometimes it might have some less pleasant flavors. For example, I tend to get a lot of mushroom character out of Hornendal uh, if there isn't any sort of extra uh, hop character in the pier and I fermented it colder, so uh, just something to be aware of. Lastly, Kvike is going to attenuate further than most of the yeast, and it's also going to drop the pH of the beer a lot more than other yeasts. So, you're going to want to make sure you have a little bit higher of a mash pH, or do some dry hopping in order to keep that pH buffer there uh, where you want it. Otherwise, your beer could taste a little bit acrid, so just stuff to keep in mind. So, before we jump into the recipe, just a big thank you to a couple different organizations here for helping make this video happen. First of all, Northern Brewer for providing me the ingredients for the batch of beer, so do check them out. I got everything I needed for this beer from them, and so can use. So there's a link down in the description box for that. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply. They make the brewing system that I brew uh, all of my beers on now. So if you're curious about that, check that link out as well, again in the description. And last but certainly not least, Grillaholics. If you're as into grilling and smoking meats as I am, please check out that link. Check out their products. They have some pretty cool grilling accessories that uh, a little bit better than what you might find on Amazon and a lot better prices too. So check that stuff out if you're interested. So now for the recipe, we are going to be starting out with 12 pounds of Golden Promise. Golden Promise is a British base malt, which is somewhere between the like rich breadiness of Maris Otter and a simple two-row. It's, it's not quite as intense as Maris Otter is, so it gives a little bit more of a neutral palate, but not as boring as plain old two-row. So uh, I'm gonna go with that for 100% of the grist. For hops, I'm using all Azaka. Uh, Northern Brewer sent me a half pound bag of Azaka, so we're using all eight ounces in this uh, brew, so <laughs> that should be fun. All of my Azaka, by the way, is 10.7% alpha acid. So we're gonna be doing a single ounce at 30 minutes. We're gonna make this a short boil, a 30 minute boil. Then we'll do one ounce at 10 minutes, and we'll do two ounces at zero minutes at knockout. Then we're gonna lower down to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit, hold it there for 20 minutes for a Whirlpool, where I'm going to do a four ounce uh, Whirlpool edition of Azaka. So we'll hold that there for 20 minutes at 180 degrees. And that should bring out a whole lot of hop flavor. Should be lots of fun. So for our water profile, I'm going for something that's relatively balanced, but with a, a decent bias towards the sulfate side of things, um, just to make the hops pop a little bit more and give it a little bit more of a perception of a drier finish. So that water profile is 106 parts per million of calcium, 16 parts per million of magnesium, 27 parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 211 parts per million of sulfate, and 70 parts per million of bicarbonate. So in order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with a base of eight gallons of distilled water going into the claw hammer system. I'm adding eight grams of gypsum, five grams of epsom, five grams of calcium chloride, and three grams of baking soda. Our yeast in this one's pretty obvious, it's Voskvike. Now the, the kvike that he sent me is dried, so I've rehydrated it, I've made a little starter for it in a mason jar, and now it's rocking and ready to go. So um, we're gonna be pitching that whole thing. It might be a lot of Voss to pitch into a beer, but it is second generation and it was all dried beforehand. It's gone through a lot, so I'm not gonna try and under pitch this one like you would do with some kvike. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and pitch the whole thing. Our mash is gonna be simple, 152 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, uh, no frills there. I added eight gallons of distilled water to my claw hammer supply 120 volt system, and I started to heat it up to the mash temperature. So while it was heating, I measured out all of my water salts. I added those to the strike water, and I milled my grain. Once the water reached my mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps in the mash. Next, I started recirculating. I let the mash sit at 152 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, but 10 minutes in, I took a pH reading and I saw an on-target pH of 5.43. 
Once the mash had sat for 50 more minutes, I raised it to the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit and I let it sit there for 15 minutes. Then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for 15 more minutes. I set the controller to 100% power at this time to get a head start on the boil. Using my Anton Parr Easy Dense, I saw a pre-boil gravity of 1051, two points lower than target. Once I reached the boil, I added my 30 minute bittering addition, which was one ounce of a Zaka. Once 20 minutes had elapsed, I added some yeast nutrient. and I added my 10 minute hop addition, another ounce of Azaka. 10 minutes later, I added my zero minute hop addition, which was two ounces of Azaka. I killed the boil by starting to recirculate boiling wort through the chiller and the pump, which is just the easiest and the best way to ensure everything's all sanitary inside. After being sure that the inside of the chiller and the pump were all sterilized, I then began to chill to 180 degrees Fahrenheit for the Whirlpool, and this took less than a minute. At that point, I set the controller to maintain 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and I added my Whirlpool hops, which was four ounces of Azaka. I let that sit in the Whirlpool for 20 minutes. Once that 20 minutes was up and the Whirlpool was completed, I started up the chilling water again, and I began to chill it down to only about 85 degrees and I took an OG sample using the Easy Dense. I saw an original gravity of 1056, which was only about two points lower than my target OG. I aerated by splashing into my anvil bucket fermenter and then I pitched my yeast again, about 85 degrees pitching temperature for the Kvike and I left it to ferment. So now let's talk about fermentation for the beer. For Voss and really truly for any Kvike strain, you really wanna just get it hot, keep it hot. If you have a heat blanket for your fermenter, that's great. Um, if you have a fermentation chamber, like a, a chest freezer, and you could keep that thing sealed and let the heat of the yeast do its own thing and heat itself up to a, a high temperature, that's also great. And the hotter it gets, the more it's gonna push these orange tangerine flavors, which are really gonna be a nice complement for the hops. A couple other options for this also are just like a, uh, a seed mat uh, for a greenhouse. I know a lot of people use those to keep their beers nice and hot. Um, or just simply wrapping it with a whole bunch of insulation and uh, hoping for the best. You can also do those sorts of things. For Voss, you really want to get it around 85 plus or minus like 5 to 10 degrees. The colder it is, the more it's just going to kind of be a clean and boring flavor. Basically, ride it out at about 75 to 85 degrees. You're probably going to see it go to its final gravity within about three days. Uh, that's one of the best things about Kvike. Uh, so once it hits that final gravity with a beer like this, you don't need to do a diacetyl rest because it doesn't generate enough diacetyl to be noticeable. Uh, you might want to leave it on there for like two days more just to kind of clean up some extra byproducts that won't show up until later on down the road. But if you're impatient, you could chuck it into a keg, let it just go ahead and put it on tap. Um, this is a, a beer loaded up with hops. I'm not trying to clarify it. So I am going to just push this into the keg as soon as it's finished fermentation and put it on the on tap. Um, it's just gonna be ready to go right away, which is nice with these hoppy beers because that hop character stays fresh and you get it a little bit earlier. Might be a little bit of hop burn in this one, maybe, we'll see. Um, but I'm interested to see how it goes. If you don't wanna use Bosque Bike, you can also use Hornendal for this one. And from what I have read, possibly from Garden, but I haven't actually used from Garden yet, so I don't really know how that's gonna go. Now, if you want a radically different beer, then you can also go ahead and just ferment this with a regular American ale yeast or a British ale yeast if you want a more New England style IPA type thing. Um, it's very flexible. Choose what yeast you want and ferment accordingly. I would highly recommend sticking with a Voss if you want this to be a fast fermentation though. That's really it, there's really no dry hopping involved. Uh, there's no need to ferment this one under pressure unless you wanna dry hop and then lock these aromas in. 
That's that is an option, of course, um, but you're going to lose some of that fruitiness from the Kvike if you do that. So just keep that in mind. One of the issues I had during the brew day today was that the temperature probe uh, during the mash kind of was a little bit further out of the kettle than it was supposed to be, which resulted in the temperature being a lot higher inside the mash than it was supposed to be. Um, it was about 10 degrees higher, which was not great, you know, but I caught it within the first 20 minutes and it, I added some cold water, got it back down to regular temp. So I'm hoping everything was fine. I hit my numbers relatively well, so I'm not too concerned. Um, but if we do see a higher final gravity than expected, that's probably the reason why. Uh, but anyway, I'm excited to see what happens here. So I'll catch you guys in a few days with our final gravity. The final gravity for this beer was about 1019, and that's not surprising given the uh, uh, mash conditions at the very beginning of the mash that I had to correct with a high mash temperature. But this was reached in about four days at about 78 degrees, and that gave me a apparent attenuation of 63% for a final ABV of 4.8%. All right, so the beer is called Take the A-Train, and it comes in at 5.8% ABV and apparently 88 IBUs as calculated by Beersmith, but that is absolutely nowhere near the actual perceived bitterness. So for appearance, it's nice and hazy. It's got a sort of dark gold appearance, which is really surprising to me considering that I only used a single malt, Golden Promise, which is a pale base malt. Uh, this looks almost like it was brewed with like a Maris Otter level of uh, kilning, but uh, honestly, it's a little bit darker than I expected. Not a bad thing though, it doesn't look unappetizing in any way. It's just not as pale as some of the other hazy beers that I've made, especially with a single malt. Uh, it's, t it's definitely quite hazy, but I think that's going to clear up over time. Decent head retention, there's definitely some lacing going on. There's also a small layer that stays on the surface for a while as well. So we're officially one week after I brewed this beer. Uh, the fermentation was very quick and very fast. I got it up to about 78 degrees uh, just from its ambient heat captured in a fermentation chamber. Was not able to get it all the way up to 85, but that is okay. Uh, the fermentation was still very fast at three to four days, I think. I kegged it on the fourth day. I slowly let it force carbonate after that for the next three days, and here we are today. Um, it's nicely carbonated, well-balanced, and uh, generally just a very good tasting beer, so I'm excited to talk about it. Now we'll go in for aroma. The aroma is a nice kind of candied orange character. There's a bit of mango in there as well. Um, actually, more than a bit. It's more of a prominent mango. Uh, so yeah, orange and mango mostly. And now for mouthfeel. Despite finishing at 1019, it's actually not too thick or heavy. It's, it's a medium mouthfeel. Um, and it's got a good residual sweetness to it, but nothing that throws the beer out of balance, which is great because I was pretty worried about that sort of thing happening. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty well balanced overall. Hi. <laughs> Do you really have to be here right now? It's a good mouthfeel for this. It feels more like a modern American pale ale. You know, it's a little bit fuller than a West Coast style pale ale or an old school American pale ale would be like. Um, but it's fine. It's really not nearly like I thought it was going to be. And um, if anything, it is not thick. It is not overly uh, full bodied in any way, which is a great thing. So now we'll go in for flavor. Mm. Flavor on this beer is awesome. I'm not gonna lie. I'm actually really, really pleased with the way it came out. Azaka, um, being the featured hop here, is definitely coming through in a really great way. Um, it's not very bitter. Uh, definitely a little bit of bitterness in here. It's not super significant though, and honestly, it it melds into the rest of the flavor of the hop really well. And there is a lot of flavor from this. I'm getting a tremendous amount of tropical fruit out of this. Uh, mostly just like a guava and a mango. Really, really strong mango. There's a little bit of like a citrus, orange, um, kind of character in here. Yeah, there's definitely not any grapefruit in this. There's definitely not any sort of prominent like lemony character um, or limey character. A little bit of a berry, a little bit of a nice kind of 
uh, twang of something slightly tart, um, which is making me pretty happy. And when I was making this, I wasn't sure if it was going to fall into the IPA category or the pale ale category based on just sheer hoppiness. Um, but it really does fall, I think, in the pale ale category, just at the upper echelon of that. The advertised IBUs are absolutely nothing like what it tastes like. It's honestly probably somewhere around 35 perceived. The interesting thing about this, though, is that it tastes very juicy. It's very similar to the um, experience you would get if you've ever gone to like a fancy hotel breakfast and you've gotten one of those pure squeezed mango juice kind of uh, things. It's, it's very similar to that, just with a grain base. Um, and speaking of grain base, the Golden Promise in this is absolutely delicious. And I'm, I haven't used it in a while, and I kind of forgot what it was like as a single malt. Um, and holy crap, it's good. It's a wonderful, crisp, and uh, lovely, grainy flavor that just really makes this beer complete. Uh, it's just wonderful. Um, nice, slightly semi-sweet kind of character. Um, and a good amount of just kind of like a... a crackery biscuitiness. It's not really up for debate. It clearly blows two row, just regular two row out of the water when it comes to being a single malt, but I'm just happy to have that Golden Promise base in here. And I'll probably continue using that for these Kvaik beers. Voss was a great option for this beer. It just blended right into the hops. You know, I can't really tell what's a yeast ester and what's a hop character, but I'm just happy it was a nice quick fermentation with no off flavors and just a really great beer at the end of the, of the process. There is one interesting and unintentional uh, part of the flavor of this beer, though. When I keg this beer, I clean the keg with the typical PBW wash and star sand finish, uh, but it was the keg that I had kegged my uh, Imperial Coffee Stout in, and apparently there was a little bit of residual coffee character because the first few sips of this beer taste vaguely like coffee beans, um, and that might be part of that interesting bitterness. <laughs> <laughs> that's blending into this. Um, unintentional creation, definitely not mad, um, but you know, probably not exactly what the recipe would have yielded otherwise. So overall, definitely very happy with this beer. Um, would definitely make it again. And Asaka hops, hell yes. Very good hop. Very happy with the way that came out. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed brewing my first beer here at the new place. Anyway, if you want to support the channel, it would mean a great deal to me if you bought some merch. I have this design in t-shirts and hoodies and many other different things, as well as many others. You'll see those all down below the description box. I get like 30% of the sticker price off of those, so it really does help quite a bit. Secondly, if you could like, comment, share, and subscribe, that would be wonderful. It really will help my channel grow quite a bit. I also have a Patreon linked in the description box. My Patreon supporters are my biggest fans, and they are really the people that are really driving the production behind this channel and making it a better YouTube channel along the way. So thank you for your support. I also have an Amazon store linked down in the description box where you can see every piece of homebrewing gear that I thoroughly recommend that I've used. If it's on that list, I've used it and I fully endorse it. Also, I have channel membership, so please do check that out if you want a couple extra perks for being a channel member. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer, where you can see slightly more frequent content updates. Thank you very much for being here. It means a whole lot to me, and I'm very excited to finally start getting grain to glass videos pumped out again. It is honestly so much more fun to brew than it is to talk about equipment, but that's just my opinion. But anyway, thank you for sticking around to the end. It means a lot to me. So until the next one, cheers. <sighs> Want a sip? All done? Like melon and, dude, that's not for touching. Go, hey, that's not for, <sighs> okay, dude, come on. Let's get off the table, okay, okay, let's go.